Hey guys, welcome. Hello, gentlemen. Good to see you. Hey, nice great to, to finally you. meet and hear you in person. I know. <laughs> I always imagine people um, as their default pick. Like that's the only <laughs> position they're going to be in. <laughs> Like the only yeah, like purple background that's exactly how i picture you <laughs> i feel and it's funny because jesse had the purple background forever and i had to change uh the spaces beta purple circle kind of was sort of being obsolete because there's no more beta testers right and so i was like oh, how do i incorporate the purple because i sort of had infused it into my brand and then so jesse had the background purple i'm like that's the only thing i can think of so i did it and i totally copied you jesse so um paying homage to you but also thanks for the idea <laughs> Still like an artist, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, on my reading list, I need to read that one. But yes, exactly. So it's 2 a.m. in Bali. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Just wow. shy. Th three seconds. Yeah. John wow. makes me wake up at such uh, such weird hours. So I'm going to I'm going to invoice him later on, but he doesn't know yet. <laughs> well, if you we stayed, if you were still in the Netherlands, this would only be what? Uh, evening uh, for you? Uh, yeah, there are six hours earlier so that will put me right. at eight eight yep so i think yeah. it's your fault for moving to somewhere so tropical and beautiful <laughs> yes yeah that, that's the that's the price i pay so uh, it's fine <laughs> that's great that's great and hey jesse how's it going nice to see you a few other people whose names i recognize jennifer great to see you as well jennifer and i i'm in actually jennifer's uh, audience and income uh, community, which is, which is super cool. It's been a great experience so far. I, I need to dive into it a little bit more than I have, but, uh, her and Justin have been doing an awesome job. Hey, how's it going? Have, they've been doing a really awesome job. Oh, and there's a puppy in the background, um, leading that community. So it's been a, a new and great experience. So it's great to see Jennifer here too. Trevor, who I've uh, never met, but interacted with on Twitter and James as well. I think James is in the UK, if I'm not mistaken. And Anurag, uh, who I have also cool. never met, but we've communicated a little bit on Twitter as well. So cool to see you guys all here. And it looks like we have uh, Trevor to represent the coffee, our coffee guy. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, really That's great. Cool. Well, Dylan, thanks so much for being here. Um, we're super excited. This is our first um, public event um, hosted by Build Your House Club. And with Ooh. Build Your House Club, um, we're just focused on uh, defining our personal brand and uh, producing consistent value, which is a challenge for all of us, which is why we wanted to build a community that focuses on that and kind of finds frameworks to, to kind of supercharge what we want to do, which is why growth currency um, seemed to be the perfect fit. So we're super excited to hear a little more about growth currency and how you're curating and creating this content to really empower us. And it's a lot like what they say, which is, you know, knowledge is power and you're equipping us and putting the tools in our hands. So we would love to learn a little bit about your journey and uh, your vision behind the newsletter. Oh, uh, Jesse, I think you might have to unmute him. <laughs> Thank you. I muted myself there just so you guys wouldn't hear my kids running around in the background while you're chatting there. Um, you might so hear mine too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, just a quick background for me. Um, I'm a marketer by day and just doing my, you know, my Twitter, having, having fun on Twitter by night, uh, actually more so by early morning. I usually am up pretty early, um, around 4 30, 5 AM to kind of focus on that. So, um, yeah, I've just been, uh, enjoying growing the growth currency brand on Twitter and growing the newsletter over the last um, few months and really uh, I'll get into it a little, in a little bit, but my journey is to kind of taking some turns as they always do. So um, we are here now, but it took a little while to get here. Very cool. Yeah. Um, can you, Dylan, can you tell us a little bit about um, what inspired your newsletter? What was the, mm -hmm. um, I guess the aha moment or what, what gave you the heart to really start something and help other people? Uh, there's a few a few motivating factors. Um, one of them being just my ego, <laughs> wanting to, <laughs> I'll just fully admit it. Um, I like sharing my ideas and my thoughts, and I'm fully in doing so. I'm fully 
willing to acknowledge that my ideas are not necessarily right. Um, they're just my thoughts and my ideas, and I'm totally open to other people's ideas and feedback. So, um, but I did want to, I felt like I had something to share. So I wanted to get that out there. So I started doing that um, on Twitter, just primarily as, you know, really short form, getting that information out. And then I was writing some kind of mini essays, but I didn't really have a place to put them. I didn't have a website. And so I was like, well, I'll just start a newsletter because Substack is easy and you can start it for free and host things and, you know, get, you know, your mom and your dad and your grandma on your newsletter as subscribers. And then you're actually sending it out to somebody because everybody's got to start somewhere. Right. So, um, so I started doing that and that was uh, January. Actually, I wrote my first post in December of this past year of 2020. And then um, it just kind of started formulating sort of what I wanted to do with it. Um, and it kind of grew from there, but, uh, to answer your question, actually, my, my inspiration or motivation behind it was, um, Danny Miranda. I don't know if you guys are familiar with his podcast, the Danny Miranda podcast. I started listening to it in the fall and, uh, Dickie was on there, Dickie Bush. And, um, he just, Danny said, you know, I started doing this podcast with the goal of just doing a hundred reps. So he's going to do a hundred podcasts before he changes his mind and, and decides whether he wants to do it or not. And I'm like, well, if he can do a hundred, like dedicate himself to just doing a hundred podcasts. That's sounds like way more work than doing like a hundred newsletters. And I'm really good at starting stuff and I'm really bad at finishing stuff. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to start writing a newsletter once at least a weekly newsletter for a hundred um, publications in a row. Then not exactly realizing that's about two years straight, but Hey, that's, that's what I've <laughs> kind of dedicated myself to. So that's where we're at. That's very cool. And that's kind of, um, what we're doing with Build Your House Club, where um, we, I think uh, Jesse, who's in the audience, Jesse Oldin, um, he said it best, which is it's like sprints. So 21 days and it's a sprint. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like, you know, when you start doing something like that and you pick, you pick a metric like 100 days, it takes a lot of pressure off and you can really focus on the craft and the discipline. Um, yeah. So I'm really glad, glad you said that. Um, so for those who haven't seen your newsletter, how would you mm -hmm. describe it? What if they open up their inbox, uh, what what would they expect? That's a good question. So you'd see um, right now it's a little bit it's a little bit wild. I've been trying to get feedback uh, from people, so um, it's still a work in progress. And I just got some really timely and valuable feedback this week that it's a little bit too much going on, to be honest. So my newsletter really is um, curated links to resources, um, tools, courses, uh, tips, communities, that sort of thing, focused at creators and, um, you know, marketers as well. But I mean, to be a creator and, and actually get paid to be a creator, you do have to be a marketer. So it kind of goes hand in hand. So the newsletter is, is focused on um, really curating really good sources to help you in your creator journey. Um, so you'll see lots of links in our last edition, um, working on slimming that down because it's a little bit of an overwhelm, uh, as I've been told, which is the feedback I needed. So um, yeah, that's what you'll see. Uh, I think I had Build Your House Club as one of the communities in our one of our my more recent uh, newsletters a couple right. editions ago. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's I, I like it as it, I started it as a resource, if I was in the position of a creator, not really knowing where to start, what would I want? And so um, I thought I would kind of start something like this. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think curation is so important. Um, without it, we spend hours and hours and hours trying to find um, the right sources. A lot of it's not that good. And yeah. um, finding that cream of the crop is really valuable. And that's what you're doing. And it's almost like you're providing all the hard work um, and then instilling it for everybody, which I think is super cool, um, especially towards a specific audience. So creators mm -hmm. or, um, which is really important. And creators can then spend more time creating um, <laughs> instead of trying to Google and, and find ways to optimize uh, what they're doing or to get better at their craft. So I think that's really, really cool. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so what has been your biggest challenge with the newsletter? And you've mentioned a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, the biggest challenge, uh, there's a few, I think, one is honestly getting feedback like that. That has been probably my biggest challenge is um, trying to figure out what's resonating with people and what um, isn't. 
what could be better, what could be improved, what sucks. I always had the, at the end of my email, I always kind of put a footer, you know, tell me what you loved and tell me what sucked because I don't want to do the part that sucked again. So, so let me know. And, you know, people are busy. I totally get it. I, I would estimate a large majority of people don't even make it to the bottom of the email, but um, I think I am really, I really like to give feedback, not in a, I know better than you way at all. It's not from that standpoint is because I think people who are publishing online actually want to do a better and better job at it. So when I approach feedback, I approach it as like, this was good. And you could be even better if, you know, you did X, Y, Z, in my opinion, um, maybe not take it or leave it, but that's just kind of from my vantage point. So I, when I get that feedback, it's like, yes, thank you. Um, that's what I want to hear. So, so getting feedback has been probably the biggest struggle, um, even more so than growing the newsletter. Like I'm not looking for like rocket fuel growth on my newsletter. I really, I would rather kind of grow it slowly, methodically and intentionally than just go like, you know, do a kind of clickbaity scam to get a whole bunch of people to sign up and for free, a free ebook. That's not to say that I, I don't want to do that, but um, I'd rather build it kind of the right way and create a really valuable resource that sort of sells itself. So feedback definitely is my biggest challenge. That's really good. And feedback, and then the point you mentioned about uh, organic growth, um, I think we see it all over Twitter where somebody has thousands and thousands and thousands of followers but they're not getting a lot of engagement um, yeah. where if you have a thousand followers, you might keep, be getting five times engagement and not by percentage, by the numbers sometimes. Um, Cause mm-hmm. you'll see people with 40,000 followers and they have 10 likes someone with 2000 <laughs> and they have 30, 40. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. Organic is very important. Agreed. Yeah. I, that brings a good point. Um, Jennifer, who's in the, uh, in the audience here, her, her husband, Justin, um, he, he tweeted a little while ago, he said, it seems like on Twitter, he comes from more of the LinkedIn. He's a, he's really well known on LinkedIn and he came to the Twitter world and started focusing more on Twitter in the recent uh, past. And he dropped a tweet that said, it seems like the smaller accounts are providing way more value than the big Twitter accounts. Like the people mm-hmm. with 50, 60, hundred thousand followers, obviously not always the case, but that was just kind of his observation. So, um, I think in part, that's just because the bigger accounts don't necessarily need to um, drop as much value. Some of them will just, based on their name alone or their brand alone, they can, they'll can they amass that many followers. But it is interesting that the people who are really wanting to, um, you know, grow in their, in their Twitter content have, you know, the smaller following. And, you know, that if they're doing it right, that's only for a matter of time. I mean, Dickie was providing tremendous value, Dickie Bush. Um, and then now he's finally reaping those rewards where he's, close to, I think, 30,000 followers, whereas in August, not even a year ago, he was at, I think, you know, 600 or something like that followers. So like, mm-hmm. if you're providing the value, um, small, ac- <coughs> small account, excuse me, or not, you're gonna, yeah. you will grow. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so what has been the most rewarding thing for you for the newsletter? Uh, that's a great question. The most rewarding thing? Hmm. I think having an outlet um, to help people has, has been great. When I get a feedback from somebody saying, oh man, this is, this is super helpful. This is really cool. I didn't know about this. I wish I knew about this before. Um, that makes me feel like I'm doing my part in contributing to the creator economy and helping people you know, live their dreams to some degree, even if it's just a small portion of it. So that's definitely been... Uh, I think that's definitely been the most rewarding aspect of it. Like financially, I've not really gained. I don't think, I don't think I could say I've gained anything from it. Um, I think I've made a couple of small affiliate sales, but I'm not sure if those are from tweets or if they were actually from the newsletter. So I'm, I'm really doing this to help people. Um, at this point, I always want to be helping people. That'll be my North star. And then my hope is to eventually be able to monetize it in a way that isn't, you know, sleazy. Um, I, I like authenticity and, and being able to help people and, and then being able to bring in a monetization element where people feel like it's worth paying for, like the value is there to pay for yeah. whatever I'm providing them. That's good. And I think the heart is so important behind it. And I think if you always uh, have, you know, a vision to help people and not, you know, something uh, to get like a quick transaction, um, 
that's better for longevity and it's better mm-hmm. in the in the value you're offering because people can see it. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, like with uh, affiliate sales, um, as you know, as popular as they are and as much money as you can make with them, I just feel like it's not for me. It's it's too much of a transactional relationship that I'm not really interested in. One thing that COVID has taught me is that I really like, I miss working with people and, and being around people. So doing stuff like this really li- lights me up, seeing you know people's faces and engaging with them. So I, I'm more, I'm not into really the transactional type of relationship. And I get that people, you know, that's, they want to make a business doing affiliate marketing and that's what they have to do. And I respect that, but yeah, it's just not really for me. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I do still post affiliate links in my email because um, one, I find the things that I post very helpful. They've helped me. And I think if they help me, they could help other people. So I share them um, and I have affiliated with them and I feel that, authentic about that. I did a post about being an authentic affiliate. So um, I feel authentic in promoting, you know, things that I use and that I enjoy and that I think could actually help people as opposed to just any ebook that's, you know, somebody's flogging (laughs) that they could get commission for. So (laughs) that's kind of my, you know, my philosophy around that. That's good. And there is a a question I get a lot because I tweet a lot about writing and Mm -hmm. um, a common question I get is, um, if you're if you're writing, even even for a niche audience, uh, sometimes you have to balance what you want to publish. In other words, something maybe a little a little deeper, a little less popular. Like you won't get as many likes, um, you won't get as many um, as much engagement, versus yeah. what people what people are like you know they're searching for like crazy for. Um, so how do you balance your passion, your core passion, with what people want? Um, if that makes sense. I don't know if that's. Yeah, no, it totally does. <laughs> it totally does. Um, <laughs> and I think ship 30 has kind of fleshed that out a little bit too, for me, um, ship 30 for 30, which I think probably most of you are familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's easy to publish on, oh, it's not easy. I shouldn't say that, um, you know, appealing to the masses with kind of generic help, self-help sort of tips and advice or earn money by doing X, Y, Z. That's that is what people are looking for. And that definitely gets engagement and clicks. Um, and it's tempting to always kind of go down that road. So I still, I have noticed that several of my essays have catered to kind of that broader appeal. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, not that you were suggesting that it is, but I guess I think if you are wanting to, you know, have those, some of those deeper, more meaningful conversations, you, you don't need to, you can't write for engagement. You can't write for clicks and, and likes and subscribes. Um, if you want, if you actually want to get kind of those inner, more heartfelt subjects, topics, things that matter maybe more. Um, and so, yeah, finding the balance in that it can be tricky, especially if you're trying to grow, if you're trying to build a business too. So um, I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but I, I think that yeah, I, I haven't found a really a good a good balance yeah. of that. I, I'm working on a, an essay that I have yet to ship today because it actually I've, I'm second guessing whether you know I'm doing that whole thing like is this going to actually get engagement? You know, are people going to resonate with this, or is this just me just kind of sharing stuff that no one's going to care about? So I I kind of can relate to that topic too. <laughs> no, and that's good, and I I like what you just said. Like you you can't necessarily just write for the likes. Um, mm-hmm there and there is a balance you know it's it's what i want to write what people need and what's going to resonate um and i think it's a hard question i think if you put people first um you know it's always put people first but then also write and publish um aligned with your vision uh Mm -hmm. it's hard but i think you know all of us will find some sort of balance in in that if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think, I think so. The people yeah. will be able to tell too, if it's not, if you're not being authentic to who you are For and sure. to your, to your brand too. For sure. Yeah. All right. I have a question that we all probably struggle with. I know I do. Um, I know, uh, my co-host with, uh, build your house club does is <laughs> how do you deal with, uh, imposter syndrome? Ooh, hey, Jesse, weren't we just talking about this uh, yesterday? <laughs> um, yeah, I tweeted Jesse uh, or DM'd him saying, I'm not sure what I what value I have to really share. But um, yeah, so that's a great example of it. 
I think imposter syndrome for me is, is kind of just that, like, I've been doing this only for a few months and you guys were so kind and gracious to invite me to, to talk with you. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> and so I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, figuring it out every day. So dealing with imposter syndrome, I think is it first, you know, admitting that you don't know, and it's okay not to know. Um, and, and just accepting that most people are in the same boat. Um, also realizing that just because you don't think you have value to share with people doesn't mean that you don't. I think we're all caught in this kind of, um, you know, some people call it knowledge blindness or curse of knowledge, or, you know, this kind of trap of you're, you're in your everyday routine and it, what feels mundane to you um, might actually be really helpful to other people. So I think we all need to realize that we do have something that we can add uh, to the conversation. And, and um, yeah, just because, like I said, just because you don't feel like you are helping people doesn't mean that you're not, you just, you just don't know until you try. So dealing with the imposter yeah. syndrome is challenging for sure. Um, and yeah, I, I just kind of take it, take it day by day in stride. <laughs> That's good. How, well, how so do you guys, how do you guys deal with it? Or do you, do you not have to? That's a good question. Um, for me, I think, I think it's a daily struggle, but I think when I remind myself a little bit in a humble way, not in a prideful way, but like the things, sometimes I forget to look back and say, what have I accomplished? Um, it's always like, what haven't I, what haven't I done? Um, yeah. And when I, when I look back at my challenges, when I look back at where I am today and where I was, um, that helps a lot. And then it's just like what you're saying is most of the time, nobody really knows what they're doing anyway. Um, so I think it's funny because it might sound uh, counterintuitive, but to battle imposter syndrome, it takes humility. Because mm. I think a lot of times it's, it's a pride issue. We think we're not good enough because we expect ourselves to be higher. Um, Interesting. There's a, a higher yeah. image of ourselves. So what does humility look like in that perspective? It's, it's being a student. It's uh, always seeking to learn. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're always seeking to learn and, and you're open that way, I don't think uh, you're going to face moment, too many moments of imposter syndrome because you know, you're know you not putting yourself on a high pedestal. You're always learning and you're humble and you're always a student um, that, and you're always curious. That That's a really good point, actually. That reminds me, John, um, that uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Jay Akunzo. Um, He's got a a great podcast called, um, I'm going to forget what it's called, so I'm not going to try to remember, but uh, he's got a great podcast. <laughs> Look him up. Um, and he has this concept called um, ex being an explorer versus being an expert. So if you approach a subject um, as an expert and you kind of have that mindset and you're trying to teach something as an expert, you know, you're bound to run into imposter syndrome, of course, unless you maybe are a true expert in the field. Whereas if you approach a topic and you want to write about a topic and you, you don't think you're an expert and you, you hesitate to write about it because you don't think you're an expert, explore it, um, approach it as an explorer, as somebody who's just kind of learning and figuring it out with the reader as they go. So you're not, um, I, I think that's at least a good framework for me to kind of defeat that, you know, I need to look like I know everything to the people that are reading. If you, if you approach it from more of an explorer standpoint, I think, or mindset that kind of alleviates a bit of that. So yeah, that, that's great. I've, yeah. I've tried to sort of keep that mindset. I, I forgot about that. I should have remembered, but I forgot about, about that when you <laughs> asked me. So I think that's a great, a great framework to use. Yeah. That's perfectly said. Um, all right. So Twitter growth, <laughs> what's your, <laughs> what's your biggest advice on growing on Twitter? If you had to give it, you know, in a sentence or two yeah, um, for people that want to grow. Oh man, brevity is not my strong suit. <laughs> um, so engage with, engage with others would be kind of my number one thing. Um, mm. Be engaging, ask questions and provide value. I know that's sort of generic saying provide value, but we all have kind of a niche or an area of interest. We can provide value as explorers um, and as experts. But if we are, you know, humble, authentic, and we can engage with others and ask, you know, good questions, um, I think that's really, that's where I've seen the most success. 
Yeah, no, that's great. And, and I agree engagement, um, you know, providing value, but building relationships. Yeah. And when you mentioned engagement, it, it makes me think of that. I think exactly. the most, when I link to the most or to the moments of my biggest growth, um, like, you know, one day all of a sudden, um, a lot of people follow me or, um, in, in one week I'm doing really well. It always has to do with relationships, what's happening in the DMS, mm -hmm. um, somebody that I got to know retweeted something and then that caught on. Uh, yeah. and if you're doing Twitter, right. Um, it's usually starts with you engaging with people. Um, they follow you. They, they start seeing your tweets. Mm -hmm. You start messaging them on DM. And then now you're doing video chats and phone calls. And it's amazing <laughs> yeah. how many like friendships you're building, you know? Um, it is. And in this chat, we're all over the world. And uh, I know for sure there's a 12 hour uh, time difference right now. Um, so it's just amazing to see how big of a world Twitter can open up for you. So I think those points are great that, that you're uh, giving for growth. <laughs> Thanks. I, I'll maybe add one more just as you're talking to remind me. Uh, consistency is pretty important too. Um, oh, it's yeah. important with everything in life, but like showing up, um, contributing daily, even multiple times a day is awesome. Um, but consistency would be, would be, I would say a kind of a, a linchpin of success in on Twitter. Yeah. For sure. And, uh, Dylan, there's a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Let me just grab that. I'll read it out loud that way. Okay. Um, everyone can see it, but how will you define asking good questions? To me, it fits into the extremes of being stupid and being an expert on asking a question. Don't know if it is just me or does it happen to others too? I think, yeah, asking good questions. Um, I did, I was very vague with that, so I apologize. I think, I think um, when I say ask good questions, you don't want to necessarily force a question. So you have to actually be uh, interested in the topic. But approach things like a, I've heard people say, approach things like a, a fifth grader. Like, how does that work? Explain it to me like I'm a fifth grader. Like, I, do, I, I legitimately don't understand blockchain. So if I want somebody to explain blockchain, I'm gonna be like, can you break this down for me a little bit simpler? Um, I mean, that's not a great question, but like, I think having that kind of curiosity um, and not being, you know, ashamed to ask those kinds of questions um, help. Um, and then the other kind of questions I, I've asked when I, I guess when I mentioned how to ask or define asking good questions, I use Twitter just as like a, a basically a instant feedback loop. So ask a, gen, a relatively generic question um, that you're curious about, that you want people's opinions on, um, and you will get responses. It's crazy. People love sharing their, sharing their feedback and their opinions on Twitter. So, um, you know, a little bit of a polarizing question doesn't necessarily hurt if you're, if you're looking to get engagement, if you want to get feedback. Um, I've used Twitter to ask questions about, you know, do you listen to podcasts um, or would you rather watch a YouTube video? Like stuff like that, like just to see where people's headspaces are at. And um, I think I don't really know how I would define a good question, but those kind of few things pop into my head. So be, be kind of humble and kind of be a layman or be, I guess, approach it stupidly, like from somebody who doesn't have any idea um, what's going on. If you, if you want to engage with people, like, um, and then also um, just ask people questions about things that would serve you um, with their answers, I suppose. Yeah, that's great. Um, so if it's okay with you, Dylan, um, we'll open up the floor. If anybody else has any questions. Sure. Um, and then uh, I see Trevor wants to say something. So uh, Jesse, if you want to give Trevor the mic. Um... Hello. Hey, Trevor. Hey, hey, Dylan, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, man. Uh, nice to see you. Nice to see you face to face yeah, and chat. You too. Uh, I just wanted to add something uh, quickly to, to what you were saying, because that uh, really hits home for me. Um, John and Jesse all know that in my, in my professional life, I'm a teacher. And just that notion of good questions and, and what does good question mean? And, and, and that's something that we ask ourselves a lot when we're standing in front of like 30 or 40 kids. And uh, to me, like when I sit down and try to write a question, um, 
especially when it's trying to engage with a group of people or, or on Twitter, it's really about trying to um, create, like you started to get at it at the end there, where it's really trying to be able to spark that response. And whether that response is by creating a little bit of controversy uh, or, or whatever that is. Um, but it's like, if you just ask that basic, simple question, and I'm guilty of this, I do it all the time, um, where I, I'm trying to get people going and, and I realize that I've just been too generic or too basic and maybe one or two people are going to chime in because if all you're going to ask them is like what's their favorite donut like people are going to leave that that pretty quickly right like it's got to be something that has a little more depth to it and um, when I have hit on one of those questions where it causes people to just go even just just like one step deeper where they've got to at least give a why you know where they've got to support their answer um, yeah. that's really what you're looking for, right? Is, is just kind of to get that, you know, not something that's so complex that you're going to scare them away, but something that's going to spark conversation. Um, yeah. so anyway, I just wanted to add, just add that, that two cents. And like I said, it was, it was a good reminder hearing that discussion, uh, just for myself, when I go to sit down and try to do this in an, in the next post or thread and kind of say, well, okay, let's, let's try to push this a little further. That's awesome. I agree asking why people will be more than happy to share, share their opinion, or I, I'd say they're more likely to answer if you give them, you know, that added mm. nugget of reasoning why they, they're responding that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, is there anybody else that wants to ask a question? Uh, you could either put an emoji up or in the chat, just let us know. And we'll wait for a couple of seconds. All right, we got one for Jesse Ogin. Hey, hey, Dylan. Hey, Jesse, how are you? Thanks for uh, hopping on here with us. No, hey, no man, problem. you had Thanks something cool here. you said earlier. You know, uh, you said, you know, to be a creator, you, you have to be a marketer, right? Mm -hmm. I love how you said that because I'm coming from, you know, Songtown, Nashville, writing songs, but I appreciate awesome. all the marketers and writers out there. That's kind of why, how I found John and Jesse, but if, if you have to be a marketer, um, who, who is like your top three marketers of all times that you would follow or, or maybe one or two that, Hey, Hey, go back and check out this, check out the, what they're doing either on Twitter or, or somewhere else. Yeah. Damn. That's a, that's a good question. Okay. So in terms of, um, Man, it, I guess I hate doing the, it depends, but uh, I would say there's some people who are doing um, a, an awesome job on different platforms. So um, on Twitter, there's a number of people who I think are great. Let me see if I can try to boil them down really quickly in my head. Um, I think just because of the, you know, the industry they're in, um, Blake Amal on, on Twitter, He's the CMO um, for copy.ai and he's doing a fantastic job by leveraging his Twitter, um, his personal Twitter to really help grow copy AI. They're running uh, weekly workshops with different creators um, and different um, professionals to help grow that, that channel. And then he's dropping these like super amazing threads that, you know, have me like, just like shaking my head and like, I wish I could write a thread like this of this high value. So Blake Amal, I think it's Hey Blake on Twitter. Okay. Hey Blake. Yeah, yeah. If you're not following him, you, you probably are, but uh, yeah, he is he's the a, king of threads right now. Yeah. He's right up there at the very <laughs> least. So um, Blake is one who's, who's crushing it on Twitter. Um, and then, you know, going over to LinkedIn um, as another platform that I've, I've been on um, not as much in the recent past. Twitter's kind of consumed me over the last six months. Um, but from a pro professional standpoint, there's people, um, uh, Justin Welsh has been doing a great job on, on his platform, how to kind of grow your niche, um, and build your niche and kind of message, build your message. Um, and I'm not just saying that cause Jennifer's here, but, uh, he, he really has been an inspiration for me. Um, and then Dave Gerhard from, I want to say either drift or privy. I can't remember. I guess he's not doing a great job because I can't remember the company or store, but I remember his name and he's doing a great job. So Dave Gerhard on LinkedIn. And there's one more um, on LinkedIn, Dan. Oh, shoot. 
no, it's gonna, it's gonna escape me now, but, uh, I can, I can go get back to you on that one. Um, uh, no worries. Hey, I appreciate th- it. those are, those are a couple, a couple of great names that I see on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Cool. Cool. Thanks. John, Jesse, do you guys have any that you'd want to add to that? Um, I always, I always recommend uh, Jerry Moser because he's, um, mm. he's more SEO focused, but definitely touching on marketing. He's a good friend. Uh, we hosted him a couple of weeks ago for our right. intern, our internal live office hour. Um, but he's really great because he, he provides valuable content, but it's always linked with experience, which you don't see as often on mm-hmm. Twitter. Like you, you might see like really great points, but um, not maybe like a practical example, a real life example. And he does a lot yeah. of that. So I really like him. Um, Jesse, I don't know if there's somebody else you want to mention. And then uh, there's obvious people too, but <laughs> yeah, let's accounts. not echo it up. Yeah. Um, I think there is this guy who writes a lot about marketing for freelancers. I think he's t- Tim mm. Her- Hearst. And he has a great tweet threads about just value packed about how to really get started. So especially when I first started my freelance career, but also started the Twitter journey, I took a lot of uh, value out of those threads. So that's a good account to follow. Um, And yeah, for obvious reasons, of course, Blake is a good example to just get inspired from and then pick small bits and pieces to use in your own threads. Um, and I recently stumbled upon the account of Alex Garcia. I think he's mm. doing the marketing for the, the hustle, the newsletter. And okay. he, he, he yeah. has this, this big ass threads with such uh, like a lot of like real life examples from business cases, all geared towards marketing. But mm-hmm. he also incl- always includes like really like growth hacky kind of things companies use to grow their uh, subscriber base or to get their product in front of people. So I think that's a re- great recommendation to, uh, to check out as well. Yeah. I just threw his, um, his handle in the chat there. I, f- I featured one of his threads, I think last week in my newsletter as well. It, yeah. it was just, it was loaded. Great Definitely. Mm-hmm. Well, that was a great oh. question, uh, Jesse. <laughs> Sorry, I got I got one more um, Twitter marketing specific. Just how to use Twitter as a platform and the features and stuff. Um, Madeline Sklar, um, I don't know if you have heard of Madeline. She has about thirty five or forty thousand. Oh, it might even be more than that followers. Um, and she hosts a weekly Twitter Smarter. Her hashtag is Twitter Smarter, which is a pretty pretty fun hashtag. And she's been doing um, digital marketing for several decades. She's a about as a Twitter guru as you could come by in terms of um, just some some different strategies and different features on the platform that you can leverage. Mm. And she hosts a lot of Twitter spaces that are really informative. So keep a look out for Madeline Sklar as that's well. That's good. Yeah. And that's important because it's practical, practical ways you can use actual accounts <laughs> and platforms. Yes, exactly. Here, I'll drop her. I want to put her bio in there as well because it's kind of a weird spelling. Great. Is there anybody else that has a question? Maybe for one more question. Awesome. Well, Dylan, thank you so much for doing this. This has been awesome. Um, it's been my pleasure. I, I love how well, I can finally meet you on video and with so yeah. many people too. Um, <laughs> it's been really, really um, educational and valuable to hear uh, <laughs> the story behind growth currency and your heart behind it. Um, and we're really excited to see it continue to grow and, along with all the readers. Um, so we're really excited about that. Yeah, so where can, what, what's the best way people can find you? Uh, Twitter's kind of my home base right now. I don't have a website. Uh, I leverage Substack as kind of a makeshift website. So just go to at growth currency, which I think most people here are already, you know, following along. And then my Substack is in the profile, but it's growthcurrency.substack.com. I want to say, um, and you can don't have to subscribe, no pressure, but you can check out all my posts there. I just do a weekly Tuesday newsletter. So those would be the Great. two main places. Awesome. And I'll yeah. uh, leave it to you, uh, Jesse Van Bruggen. Um, you can sign us off. You can say, 
you know, they're our parting words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, John. First, I'm going to teach you to pronounce my, uh, my surname good one day, but, uh, we, we can take we can take our time <laughs> no thanks uh, thanks a lot dylan this was super insightful and especially on such a short notice that you were able to uh to join us i think i i, I texted you on on monday monday <laughs> afternoon or something for you so uh, yeah super super happy uh, how this uh, turned around and that you were able to uh, to share your wisdom uh yeah so uh, so like i like i said i'm gonna add some words to john like the growth currency thing is that uh, I think one of the few newsletters on Twitter that's ac actually like built in public on Twitter, which mm. is uh, which I think a great thing. Um, and yeah, definitely for those people that are more interested, I feel growth currency kind of leads people into the rabbit hole because <laughs> when that, when I open the email, I'm like, okay, these are some some topics for me to indeed explore instead of being on Twitter, which is like the, the high pace platform. So definitely, yeah. Uh, keep up with with the good work uh thank you so thanks for sharing those insights definitely some some valuable bits and pieces there to take away oh and uh, uh, awesome mm -hmm. the last thing last thing if anybody um wants to join buildyourhouse.club uh we do have a special code um make sure to visit our website buildyourhouse.club um sign up and with the word growth uh you get 15 percent off in the next like 48 hours. Um, so there is that. Hey, Dylan, you were going to say something? Yeah. I was just going to say, could you guys do a quick uh, elevator pitch for Build Your House Club for me? Absolutely. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll wing one. Um, okay. Build Your House Club <laughs> is basically, it's a cohort and we're really just focused on defining your message, defining your personal brand and providing consistent value. And we do that through live office hours but we all uh, take part on a 21 day challenge. And we have a framework, it's called micro threads, but basically we post on Twitter every single day um, for 21 days. And part of the cohort is community, it's a course. Um, and then really everyone that leaves out of it knows exactly who they are, what kind of value they wanna share and how to communicate it. <laughs> awesome, well done, on the spot. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Awesome. Well, everybody make sure to check out Growth Currency, subscribe, and uh, thank Dylan when you can on Twitter. Thanks so much for joining and we'll see you next yeah. time. It's great seeing you guys all here face-to-face. -face. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a, have a great rest of your day. <laughs> you as well. Have Bye. a good sleep. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank you a lot. <laughs> Bye, guys. See ya. Bye-bye.